Hi, everybody. Uh, it's great, great to be here. Um, throughout this presentation, I usually like to break things up with pictures. So the first picture uh, is a picture of uh, Lake Pend Oreille in northern Idaho. Um, we, we go up there quite a bit in the summer. Fun fact about this lake is it's about 1,100 feet deep, and the Navy actually has a sub-training uh, facility uh, on this lake. So every once in a while, you'll see a periscope come up, and it will freak you out a little bit. Okay, um, so I'm going to talk about intrathecal drug delivery. As Doug said, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the opioid overdose. I'm going to talk a lot about the past, uh, the need for more options, uh, opioid-induced hyperalgesia, patient selection for intrathecal drug delivery. I'm going to present a couple of low-dose clinical studies, talk a bit about CSF flow, uh, look at optimal dosing strategy, cost effectiveness. So amazing stat. One in four people receiving prescription opioids long-term in a primary care setting struggles with addiction. So that's 25% of those patients. Huge number. Um, this is an interesting graph from 99 to 2020. And you can see overdose death with prescription opioids went way up here. Uh, and then it started to come down, which is a good sign. But if you see the yellow curve here, this is regular prescription opioids. This is prescription opioids with synthetic opioids, namely fentanyl. We're seeing a huge spike with that. A little decrease here probably due, due to COVID. So even though... Oops, sorry. Yeah, I'll, I'll be able to get you here. And this has a... Does it, it, not working. Yeah, that means... There it is. Cool. Just hold that one. Okay. Uh, anyway, so even though the opioid uh, crisis here looks better, we're really dealing with a whole new crisis uh, now with the uh, fentanyl issue. Another really uh, important point, among 70 randomized trials on opioids, systemic opioids, nearly all were short-term efficacy, 16 weeks or less. Most excluded high-risk patients. Um, those with substance abuse, medical comorbidities, and psychiatric comorbidities. So, point of this slide, there are no long-term studies showing efficacy with systemic opioids for chronic pain, yet most insurance companies will approve systemic opioids and won't approve some of the other procedures we're talking about today. Uh, this is a, a, in the Ruby Valley in Montana. Uh, we were hiking and found these two guys fighting. Um, and there's no sound on here, but you could actually hear their antlers uh, smashing together. Then they kind of looked at us. Uh, all right. Um, so the past. Uh, I, like probably a lot of you, went through a period of time. A lot of you are probably still in that period of time where the touch intrathecal opioids, and it's mainly because of the past. Most of these pumps were high-dose intrathecal pumps, multiple intrathecal medicines, combination systemic therapies. So they were not only on high doses intrathecal opioids, they were also on systemic opioids, escalating doses, high pain scores, side effects, and it was a high maintenance hassle therapy. They used the most clinic resources. When Back when I was doing this traditional dosing, a pump patient would walk in the door and my staff would just go, oh, not this patient. And that was the uh, traditional way of responding to those patients. Reimbursement went down substantially. Pain providers largely lost interest in the therapy. Spinal cord stimulation became the implantable therapy of choice, better reimbursement, and it was perceived, the key word perceived as a lower maintenance therapy. We'll talk about that. Less and less pumps were implanted for chronic malignant pain. They were still implanted for cancer pain and still are. The need, why do we have a need for pumps? Well, everybody has failed spinal cord stimulation trials and implants. Back in the day, in the traditional dosing day, back pain was not well controlled with spinal cord stimulation. We're seeing much better results with that today, but we all still have failures with those patients. What do we do with those patients once they have failed uh, those other therapies? Uh, declining re reimbursement for spinal cord stimulation and more difficult insurance authorization. I rarely have a problem getting a pump authorized. Escalating doses of systemic opioids, all the uh, issues surrounded with that and the evolving concept of opioid-induced hyperalgesia. What is opioid-induced hyperalgesia? A state of nociceptive sensitization caused by exposure to opioids. A patient who receives opioids for pain paradoxically has worsening pain. 
may explain the loss of opioid efficacy in some patients. When should we suspect this? And I guarantee every one of you has seen opioid-induced hyperalgesia. Patient gets on the table for an epidural steroid injection. You have a 10 cc syringe filled with 1% lidocaine with a 27 gauge needle. You poke that needle into the back and the patient uh, hits the ceiling, right? That's the type of things we see with opioid-induced hyperalgesia. So a waning of the opioid treatment effect without disease uh, progression. These patients have unexplained pain reports. They have diffuse pain not associated with their original pain and they have increased levels of pain despite increasing dosages of opioids. What's the treatment? Really the treatment is tapering them off the opioids. So who are, who are the first choices for intrathecal drug delivery? Well, really we have, what we have to do is we have to redefine our patient selection. We wanna use the right amount of the right drug via the right route to the right patient at the right time. Who are these patients? Elderly patients are great patients, and most of my patients I do pumps on are, are elderly patients. Axial pain, spinal stenosis, patients with osteoporosis who have had multiple compression fra fractures, probably treated with vertebral augmentation, can be great candidates. Regional pain syndromes, complex regional pain syndrome, chronic abdominal pain, post-thoracotomy pain, potentially chronic pelvic pain failed back surgery syndrome, and patients who have good analgesia with systemic opioids, but have intolerable side effects, and of course, cancer pain, which I'm not gonna talk about today. This is a pronghorn antelope. This picture was taken in central Montana. Fun fact about the pronghorn, well, a couple of fun facts. Number one, they're not related to antelope in Africa, a completely different species, and they can run about 60 miles an hour, so they can get from one place to another very quickly. So looking at the publications, there are really two main people uh, who have been involved with these publications, Dr. Greider and Dr. Hamza. Both have done a couple of nice studies with low-dose intrathecal drug delivery. And that's really what the purpose of my talk is today, low-dose intrathecal drug delivery. So looking at the Greider study, um, and Dr. Greider's technique really does echo most of the ways I, I do this. Um, he started with 22 patients. They had an average VAS score of 7.3. He does a complete taper over a three to four week period. He then does a six week opioid free period. And this is what's interesting. At the end of that six week holiday, the pain score actually went down slightly in these patients. This is what I typically see in 90% of the patients in my practice. They're either no worse off or they're a little bit better. He then does an inpatient trial. I do an outpatient trial, we can talk about that. He does an additional 10 to 14 day opioid free period after the trial. 20 patients went on to implant starting dose of 140 micrograms per day. Seven days post implant, the score reduced to a 3.1. 12 months post implant, the score was 3.9 with an average dose of 335 micrograms. So very low dose with sustained pain relief off uh, systemic opioids completely. Hamza does things a little bit differently, and the point really of showing this is it's not my way or the highway. There's a lot of ways to do this. The key to me is being consistent with all patients and treating all patients the same. He tapers by 50% over the three to five weeks and then does the trial. Um, he continues weaning over three to five weeks, has a seven to 10 day opioid free interval, and then he does the implant. Looking at his pain scores long-term, he followed these patients for 36 months. You can see worse pain and average pain significantly decreased and sustained for three years. Looking at his dose, higher doses than uh, Dr. Greider, but a very low dose consistently maintained over 36 months. All right, switching gears a little bit, CSF flow, this is one of my uh, favorite topics, and this article uh, was done by Dr. Chris Bernards, the late Dr. Chris Bernards. He used to be at uh, University of Washington. He did a very eloquent study on pigs, obviously. Uh, placed a posterior catheter at T12. Did an eight hour infusion or one bolus per hour for eight hours. Infusion rates were a really low infusion rate of 0.02 cc's per hour a little higher rate at one mil per hour or one bolus over five minutes, which uh, is about 300 cc's per hour. He used radial labeled bupivacaine and radial labeled baclofen. As you guys know, bupivacaine's lipophilic, baclofen was hydrophilic. He had a hypothesis that this wouldn't travel very far and this would travel. 
He had CSF microdialysis probes, anterior and posterior, at the level of the catheter, five centimeters caudal, five and 10 centimeters cephalad, and in the cerebrum. And then at the end of the study, he sacrificed the pigs and did one centimeter tissue segments and looked at concentrations within the tissues, anterior and posterior. There was evidence that the bolus group and the 1 cc per hour group had better drug distribution than the 0.02 cc per hour group. So his hypothesis, and not his hypothesis, his conclusion here was that higher flow rates spread the drug out more and probably give better results. There were few differences between lipophilic and hydrophilic drugs. So if you're using fentanyl in a pump or you're using morphine in a pump, doesn't make much difference. Those drugs are not going to uh, move uh, much beyond the tip of the catheter. Location of the infuser ca infusion catheter tip may be critical, and I think it is. You have to have dorsal catheter placement. If you put your catheter anterior, the drug is not going to get to the posterior horn where the receptors are, and you want to have a dermatomal catheter placement in the region of the patient's pain. And then developing ways of improving drug di distribution, higher flow rates, bolus dosing, likely decrease the incidence of granuloma. This is a, what they call in Mongolia a, a GUR, and this is what traditional Mongolians live in. I, I get, was fortunate enough to do a week-long uh, fly fishing trip in Mongolia. Uh, this is what we slept in uh, every night, and they're pretty ornately uh, decorated. And uh, Mongolia, interestingly enough, is a lot like Montana in terms of the countryside. All right. so. Strategies. Terminology varies. You can call it targeted drug delivery. You can call it low dose targeted drug delivery. You can call it microdosing. I think microdosing is the term everybody is most familiar with. What are the main components? Eliminating systemic opioids. In my opinion, this is a huge uh, aspect of this. If you don't eliminate the systemic opioids, you are not going to be able to do a low dose technique. Starting at low doses with physician control. And like systemic opioids, that's patient control. This has physician control. Minimizing, eliminating dose escalation. You don't want to keep increasing the dose and chasing the perfect pain score. Patient uh, flexibility. You can do a simple continuous infusion. You can give the patient a programmer that allows them to give themselves boluses when they need it. Or you can have automatic bolus dosing, also called flex dosing. And basically what we're doing is we're applying good clinical skills already in use to manage dose escalation with systemic opioids. Advantages, a lot of these are obvious. Achieve steady state around the clock dosing, reduce side effects, and there's studies to support that. Intermittent dosing, as I talked about, um, again, maximum flow rates give you better spread. Elimination of systemic opioids, reduction in longitudinal costs, and I'll show you a couple of papers on that. And safety, uh, thinking about pocket fills, everybody's concerned about a pocket fill if it occurs, putting all the medicine in the pocket as opposed to putting it in the pump. I start these patients at a quarter milligram per cc of morphine. If you have a 20 cc pump, injecting that volume into the pocket probably is not gonna cause any harm whatsoever. There's almost been no granulomas reported with a low dose technique. And we often do dye studies in order to show the patency of a catheter if the, if the system's not working. You can't do that if you can't aspirate CSF, but if you have a very small amount of drug in the catheter, you can still do that dye study. So how do you talk to patients about this? Explain hyperalgesia to the patient in terms that they can understand. Explain the purpose of intrathecal drug delivery. Point out their high pain scores. I've never seen a patient on systemic opioids that's been referred to me that has low pain scores and says, Dr. Hathaway, I'm doing great. Sometimes they'll say it takes the edge off, but rarely does anybody say they're doing great on systemic opioids. Point out their low activity levels. Explain to the patient the available options if the trial fails. Uh, I, I tell them, if this doesn't work, we can put you back on long-acting opioids, likely at a very, very low dose since we've reset all of your receptors. It has better pain relief than high-dose oral medication, less side effects, et cetera. This is an interesting little paper that came out of the University of British Columbia to explain what happens with systemic opioid dosing. And basically, when you take an immediate release opioid, you get a high blood level. That blood level rapidly goes down until you get past a threshold level, and the patient starts exhibiting withdrawal symptoms. Withdrawal symptoms usually begin with pain. It can be their same pain or it can be diffuse pain. 
They take another opioid and they incorrectly interpret the opioid as treating their pain when really what it's doing is treating end of dose withdrawal. Uh, you need to partner with primary care and re, uh, referring providers to do this therapy. You gotta make sure the primary care providers are aware of the therapy and its reasoning. You don't want the patient going back to the referring doctor and says, Dr. Hathaway, jerk, he wants to take me off my opioids. I never wanna go back there again. We do marketing lunches with primary care providers to explain this process. It's more likely accepted if the patient hears about it from someone else. Before they hear about it from you, you're going to have more buy-in. Patient expectation is huge. They need to know this isn't going to completely eradicate their pain. They may get 50 to 70% pain relief, and that's going to be much better than where they are now. Um, you also have to explain so they know that once they get this pump in place, that's going to be the only opioid therapy that they're going to get. Taper is huge, as I said. It's mandatory to achieve the best outcomes. It's mandatory to select motivated patients. If a patient is not willing to taper, I don't want to put a pump in that patient. That's what led to nightmares in the past. Uh, unmotivated patients had pumps placed. They didn't do well, and those became the hassle patients in the practice. Some patients desire a quick taper, 10 to 20% every three to five days. Some patients desire a slow taper, several weeks to a few months. I don't care how long it takes as long as they're actively tapering. Some type of opioid holiday should occur. There's no study to support one duration of a holiday over another. I think the longer that holiday is, the more likely you are to have benefit with this therapy. But potentially it's okay to do a, a low a, a short holiday for low-risk patients and a, and a longer holiday with high-risk patients. We do urine jug testing prior to the trial to make sure patients are truly off of their opioids. Everybody has pre-surgical psychological clearance. Just another scene from Mongolia, sunset with the uh, GERS in the background. So trial goals. It, what we're really doing is assessing the efficacy of intrathecal medicine administration for, for pain management. It determines whether there is sufficient pain relief. It determines whether there's improved functioning. It does not determine the dose. Another thing a patient needs to be told up front is it may take a few months to find the optimal dosing to get the patients to that right place. Trial considerations. You can do an inpatient trial or an outpatient trial. I do an outpatient trial. I've been doing this for years. It works well. I put an intrathecal catheter in. Uh, the patient comes in over a three-day period, gets one of three doses each day, 100 micrograms of morphine, 200 micrograms of morphine, or a placebo. Uh, they all know that one of their doses is going to be a placebo. You do have to give patients consent when you're giving a uh, placebo. The length of the drug trial you have to determine. Compliance with payer guidelines. Uh, again, we talked a lot about Noridian, the evil Noridian. Uh, in the Northwest US, actually, Medicare does require a catheter trial. Trial methods, epidural versus intrathecal, continuous, single shot, intermittent bolus with a catheter. No method has been proven to be superior. So I always like to have a fish quiz or two during most of the talks I give. Can anybody, anybody know what kind of fish this is? You kind of got a hint because it is from Mongolia. Not many people know. This is called a taimen. It's the largest salmonoid in the world, bigger than king salmon. Um, very fun to catch. Um, they're very uh, narrow and uh, long. And uh, I fished for a week, I only caught two, and my goal there was just to catch one, so I at least met the goal. But my buddy caught five, which was a little irritating. Okay, uh, medical cost impact. I've been involved in two claims analysis studies uh, for intrathecal drug delivery. Uh, this one uh, was from 2014, and the takeaways from this is that 51% of the patients in this claims analysis study eliminated systemic opioids in the year after uh, implantation. Elimination resulted in a significantly, uh, statistically significant 10 to 17% reduction in yearly inpatient, outpatient, and drug expenditures. So eliminating systemic opioids after implant can be accomplished successfully in patients with chronic pain. We followed this up in 2019 with, with another study, and we fully expected the amount of patients to taper to be higher in this, but I think what we didn't take into consideration is that 
the claims analysis data ended at 2016. 2016 is when the CDC came out with the opioid criteria. There are plans to repeat this study, and I think we'll, we will see more patients off of systemic opioids in the future. But we looked at the cost savings a little bit uh, closer in this, and we looked at two types of patients, patients who discontinued at any time point versus continued, or patients who discontinued very early uh, versus continued. And as you can see here, both groups had a significant reduction in cost, 11,000 reduction here, 16,000 reduction here, 29%, 43%. So this did show that discontinuing uh, leads to much more significant cost savings. The other interesting thing is, is most of the saving was not from opioid prescriptions. Only 17% was from the opioid prescriptions. Most of the savings was from medical visits and non-opioid prescriptions. And then looking at this a little bit closer, we were able to determine that the break-even point in patients who discontinued at any time was 19.4 months and in patients who uh, discontinued early was at 13.2 months. So after 13 months, the pump has pretty much paid for itself via this cost effectiveness uh, data. And that's the end. This is a, uh, a brown trout from Patagonia uh, in Chile, Chile Patagonia, which again is another beautiful place. So my goal is to fish in as many weird places as possible. So that's it. Any, any questions at all? So right. just a comment. Oh. Dan, go. Uh, <laughs> you utilize polyanalgesia or you just opioid? I'm, in other words, you have to do any local admixtures? What yes. Do do? Um, I try to stay with monotherapy with morphine as much as possible. Obviously, some people are sensitive to morphine, especially older men get urinary incontinence, more so with uh, intrathecal morphine as opposed to something like intrathecal hydromorphone. So um, my probably next most common agent is going to be mo uh, monotherapy with hydromorphone. Um, typically what I'll do is I start people out with a flex dosing, a bolus mode where they get a couple or maybe up to three boluses per day with a very, very low continuous infusion. Um, if I get up to my ceiling dose, which my ceiling dose is 0.4 milligrams per day, so I have very few patients above 0.4 milligrams per day. If they get up to that and they're not doing well, at that point I may switch them to a continuous infusion mode and see if they respond to that. If they don't respond to that, then that's where I'll probably add something like bupivacaine to the pump, which is off-label. Um, but and pretty much everything's off-label except for morphine, monotherapy. But, but that's what I'll do in that situation. With cancer pain patients, totally different ballpark. We kind of throw the fence at cancer patients, so whatever makes them feel better uh, the quickest is, is what we typically do there. So one of the things that I, that I see that is a very common mistake and is using systemic opioids in addition to pump. If you do that, we can't be friends anymore. I mean, that's just not the right thing to do. And you see failed, in, in, in my practice, we, I'm from a different specialty, and so this, this old throwback notion that pumps are bad, just like what uh, John was referring to earlier, that comes from systemic opioid in addition to pump. The cytochrome P450 in the liver is amazing. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum can stretch from here to the sun and back in some people. And if you shower, you take pills, it's going to release itself in the jejunum. 80% of the blood supply to the liver is from the small intestine, primarily. It's from, it goes in through the portal venous system. 80% is through the portal venous system. That carries and showers the liver with opioids that's digested in the liver by the cytochrome P450 system. Back in the day, we used a rule, and I'll tell you this story so you'll never forget this. Back in the day, where there was not a limit pre-2017, uh, we used to see people that are on you know, 300, 400, 600. My record was 1,200 milligram equivalents of morphine. And I used the rule on a non-opioid naive patient, 100 to 1, 100 milligram equivalents by mouth equals one milligram intrathecal trial. And I do inpatient. My doses are a little bit higher than Dr. Hathaway's. Otherwise, it's shockingly similar. And I had this guy that was on 1,200 milligram equivalents. And it was uh, before Dr. Phillips. So I asked my fellow, what should we give him? <clears throat> he goes, 
12 milligrams, but we can't really do that, can we? And I'm like, no. I mean, 12 milligram bolus dose, that's insanity, right? So I gave him eight. That's still insane. And so I said, you know, have the Narcan ready by the bedside. And we made, an, we made a Narcan drip, right? Because I don't really know what's going to happen. And so gave him eight milligrams of morphine. Guess what happened? What do you think happened? He stopped breathing. No, he didn't stop breathing. He was fine. Two hours later, how are you doing? Fine, I feel great. Pain's all gone. And what happened later? Three hours later, in a dose in an opioid naive patient that would last 36 to 48 hours, and somebody that's on normal doses would last nearly 24, mostly 18 hours. Five hours after that dose, pain was raging back. He was mad and checked out AMA. So that's a lesson. There's no amount that you can pour into the intrathecal system that, how is it digested? Same way. Just takes longer to get to the liver. So there's no amount that you can pour in there to overcome tolerance that's built up almost strictly based on systemic use, pills and patches. So don't do that. And the, uh, almost all of the failures, almost all of them come from using systemic opioids in addition to pump. I can beat your record, Doug. The wow, really? I've seen is 16,000 oral morphine equivalents of cancer pain. Woo. And the patient was p pacing around like this, wide awake, horrible pain, 16,000 oral morphine equivalents. Um, and the interesting thing with these patients is you can take these patients and you can start reducing their opioids rapidly. They have opioid floating around doing nothing. Eventually, you'll reach a place where they start responding with some withdrawal effects. But for the most part, you can go pretty quickly. Uh, but everything you said, yeah, I echo that. Opioid-induced hyperalgesia is a thing. It's a thing. It's a thing. I see it a lot. And just, you know, you cannot opioid these patients' pain away. You know, chronic opioids ruins people's lives. And the, from an interventional pain physician, I prescribe virtually, I have two people on chronic opioids, both for reasons. Uh, and that's it. And if, if, I, if they're on chronic oral systemic opioids, there will come a point. There are a few exceptions. Maybe the little old lady that does good well on a 7.5 or 5 milligram dose of hydrocodone. That's, that's no problem. No, I'm not criticizing that. Criticizing putting somebody like you guys here on, on opioids. That's a terrible idea. And we know it's a terrible idea. And that's what gave rise to all the problems we have. So use, use pumps. You will like it. John, can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Comment. Uh, if you understand the hydrology of the Pacific Northwest, uh, Lake Monterey is behind a massive dam that sits uh, on the upper Columbia. I can't get my brain around because most of the roads going into it are two lane highways. I can't get my brain around how to get a sub into a landlocked lake that is surrounded by rural Really good question. Um, but they did. <laughs> uh, the military. Yep. And then uh, 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 lastly, um, uh, Montana, Mongolia, where's a better place to fish? Well, I'm, I'm going to Bolivia in July, uh, fishing for what's called Golden Dorado, which is kind of looks like a bright yellow striped bass with big teeth. And they're in little... Uh, freshwater streams that come off of the Amazon. Uh, so that's going to be pretty cool. Thank you. Yep, thanks, everybody. Great job.